Thank you very much for your presentation and enjoyed it and look forward to seeing the exhibit. I have a question. A number of years ago, the Salk Institute um, was uh, nominated for the National Register of Historic Places, but uh, over the objections of the SALT itself, um, uh, the nomination was uh, approved by the state of California but, and deemed eligible. Do you know of any movement by the SALK to uh, place the entire site, including the buildings, on the National Register? Thank you. Um, I do not know about future plans for that. I think that would be an answer best asked of Sulk, but I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> Follow up. Do you think it, the entire site should be placed on the National Register of Historic Places? I think it's a site of international, national, and local significance, so it would certainly be eligible for that, yes. I would only add that sense of the balance of landscape and architecture has been a challenge faced not just by Khan's architecture, but I think by many, many places of significance. And you certainly want that energy that comes out of doing science at the Salk. And it's, it's, it's incredible to see just how successful that is and, and that institutions like that do need to grow. Um, and that you need to find a way to do that. So for me, what's, what's incredibly inspiring about seeing the work that the Getty's doing, that the Salk has undertaken, and the culture change that's going on at the Salk, tells me that this is an institute that's taking that seriously and looking into the future. But there's pressure everywhere, yeah. right? And so that's something that we contend with. And so the idea of conservation and management planning is to have a framework that is an agree, you know, that allows for change to occur and allows one to thoughtfully think about all those different ideas as you absorb the pressures of, of what you need now, um, but not losing those things that are of enduring value. And I think, you know, with or without the designation, it's certainly being cared for. It's certainly being cared for and thought of as a historic resource, and that's the most important thing. The first speaker uh, that uh, perhaps there are some problems in the usefulness of the uh, laboratories, that there are some drawbacks in how it's designed or uh, implemented. I wonder if, if that has been corrected, if there indeed was the case, and if not, uh, what, what are some of the problems, if any? No, I, I think I'll, I'll let you answer that. Uh, I was referring, I think, to the Richards. Exactly. He, he was referring to the Richards building that he showed the picture of and not the Salk. The Richards Building was built uh, in the late 1950s, completed in 1960 for the first part and 61, I think, for the second. And it was innovative and modern, and the architects loved it. But the, the real problems were um, the corner windows, which were big glass windows flush with the brick, were, it could not be opened, and the people that used those offices were dying of the heat inside on a sunny day. And then there were also some problems with the open labs. People felt they weren't flexible enough and it didn't work for them. Uh, there were a lot of complaints over the years by people who worked in the Richards building. So even as it was being celebrated by architects and it had the first show ever in America devoted at the Museum of Modern Art devoted to a single building, that was in 1961, the architects were applauding and the people working inside the building were complaining. So Jonas Salk was aware of this. When he went to meet Lou, he saw the Richards building. He wasn't too enthusiastic about it. And so when he worked with Lou, he and the other people that were going to be part of the scientific enterprise talked about what were the needs of people in laboratories. So the Salk never had those same problems, never had that kind of problem that needed to be resolved the way the Richards did. And, and they have worked on the Richards recently and remodeled and I think solved some of the problems. I'll just I'll add briefly to that, being uh, uh, working at the University of Pennsylvania where the Richards Building is located, that um, they've uh, gone through a similar process of thinking very carefully about Richards and about maintaining the presence of science in the building, and that doing science in the building, although it has its limitations for wet lab science. And so the building in making a transition to future use is a dry laboratory. So there are not the same benches and uh, wet lab research that you see so vitally continuing at the Salk. 
Um, that's a compromise they had to make um, because the building in its dimension, each of the floor uh, uh, plates in the labs um, were envisioned as a studio-like space where that kind of interactions that maybe go on so beautifully in the courtyard at the Salk or in those interstitial spaces, not where the mechanical systems are, but where the blackboards are, where the conversations occur. That wasn't fully fleshed out or developed at, at, at Richards. Um, and the size of those spaces in the end only wound up being the right dimension for it's, they were too big for one laboratory researcher and too small for two. So immediately the open sense of space on the interiors immediately got cut up and undermined the integrity of the architect's intent. So by shifting to the wet, the dry lab sensibilities, they were able to eliminate some of those pressures, uh, maintain the connection to science, which was a battle you know, to, uh, to maintain that presence of science there. Um, and if you go to Penn today, you can see uh, an ongoing process where each of the laboratory buildings uh, are undergoing extensive interior renovations. They have design guidelines for changes into the future, uh, and they're going to begin phase two uh, of a couple of more of the towers um, uh, later this year, uh, and then begin to work on the exteriors, uh, where, by the way, they went through 200 samples of glass to get the right color of glass um, and to come up with a system by which they could modernize the glass window systems. They couldn't do double pane glass. We all think about the winter climate in Philadelphia and having a more efficient system. You couldn't do it. You'd have to change Kahn's windows, these incredible stainless steel windows. That was not a compromise that you could make uh, in the service of the science and the inhabitants, but you could come up with a slightly thicker glass. But this, again, these are the things that inspire me as an architect and an archivist and a curator seeing the conservators at work and fussing the way that they do. You know, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> is the Salk Institute air conditioned? And if it is, was it always? Can someone, is anyone from the Salk at the moment here and can answer that? I think it has, I mean, it ha it's a laboratory building and it has to circulate the air out. I would say that the, 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 the studies, so those kind of retreat, retreat spaces may, may, you know, you can open windows and you have that sort of flexibility. We were at a tour yesterday in the, la in the library area and some of the people in the library just opened the doors a bit so you have that kind of passive engagement where you open a window and you can adapt the comfort. But in a laboratory space, I think absolutely without question, you're, you're conditioning the air, you're, you're, you're changing the air 100%. Um, and that's uh, perhaps more a matter of scientific necessity than human comfort, although uh, perhaps you need a bit of both. It's true that the studies are different. And the one person whose study I visited, Greg Lemke, told me that he, he loved the way you could bring the breezes in and he demonstrated how to do that. He said, but Lou had not planned for a real Southern California climate with fogs and cold and all that. He was thinking he was building for a tropical climate. So the studies got a little cool in the, in the cool weather months. Yeah, they, ha they have heat, but I don't think it's sufficient and they don't have cooling. And that's always what we've heard too, is that you know, he, Lou had this romantic idea of what the weather was like in San Diego and the reality was not quite that. <laughs> oh, please, it's so <laughs> tough in San Diego. <laughs> I'm at the Salk, and, and uh, we do have air conditioning, at least in my office and the offices that I know. Uh, but I do have a question. Is there a sense from someone in the panel uh, of the extent uh, of Louis Barragan's um, contribution to the design, or was it just a suggestion of the plaza, or to what degree did he actually directly or indirectly do that? Uh, you'll actually see this on? Yeah. You'll see a little cor a bit of correspondence about it in the show. It was just confined to the plaza, and he didn't, as far as I know, do any drawings. It was just that piece of advice. He was brought in to give advice about, in general, what could be done with that space, and he gave it, and they did it. So it's a short story, but an important one. It's the kind of thing that, in, if you're a design student and you, uh, you study architecture in college, you get to spend 15 minutes with your professor once or twice a week. That is a big secret. Don't let anyone know. 
Um, it's a great education, though. That's what Louis Barragan came and did for Jonas Salk and Luke Hahn. He gave a design crit. Um, they weren't sure, and it seems obvious now that it's the plaza, but they needed someone to come in, and they, there, there was that doubt, and doubt is a beautiful thing in art. I think uh, part of the correspondence is that he got paid the enormous fee of $1,000 for the, for the work. You briefly mentioned that this wood paddling, paneling is a recurring element in, in Khan's architecture, and we were showing some of the other buildings, the Fisher House, the Exeter Library. Um, would there be some sort of exchange uh, uh, with the owner of these owners of the, these other buildings about your findings, where the erosion may not have been as bad because they're not in a maritime climate, but still? We actually, um, and Bill was instrumental in this, last May, um, we had a meeting at the archives at Penn where we brought together the owners and the professionals who are working on some of these other buildings. And we got together the, to talk about the challenges of conserving them and kind of shared design responses. So we've definitely been sharing information and we have, an, an, you know, we're going to actually issue a report to the, uh, related to the findings of that meeting. So we've definitely been collaborating with these other, not collaborating, but talking with these other sites to, to talk about what's worked, what hasn't, how they're addressing the problem. And I mean, one of the conventional roles that an archives plays is to serve research, whether it's for conservation, for exhibits, or so on. And so often, in the conventional sense, you're, hey, there's someone doing similar research at you, as you are, perhaps you'd want to speak to this person. Yes. Con and the use of concrete. And so, when we heard of the, the, the work that the Getty was doing with the Teak, there was already Larry Corman um, and Andrew Furon, who's a conservator and a colleague uh, who teaches at Penn, working on the cypress wood at the Corman house. And we came to understand that they were actually quite a bit further along in terms of field testing. So where, where Sarah was showing images of the wood, testing different finishes, solutions to prevent the biological growth and, and so on, Andrew was a little bit farther along in that study. Um, and so it became obvious that, you know, these, all these people need to sit down at the same table. And it was at one of my tables. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say, you know, the, the, all the sites, that you can't apply the same solution to all of them because they're different wood and they're different environmental co um, conditions. But it was really interesting to share what had worked and to talk about it in a philosophical way as, as well as a really technical way. And in addition to the professionals, Bill was really great in that bringing his expertise, and he also brought um, Henry Wilcotts, who had worked for Kahn, and he could kind of talk about the office culture and maybe kind of the thought process in terms of how these were designed. And that was a really uh, you know, wonderful kind of bringing together all these different perspectives to the table. I mean, a magic moment that happened there that I'll share with you is we had Gary Van Gerpen, who was you know, the, the director of facilities at the Salk and before Tim Ball, the, these two men know more about that building than anyone on the planet and will tell you about it <laughs> if you give them a couple hours. And it's amazing <laughs> um, to, to come to understand that. But we had Gary there who was hired by Jonas Salk and served Jonas and lived in that building for 20, 30 years uh, as an incredibly dedicated in individual, one of these people who, who really give their life to a place, and you admire greatly those individuals. And um, Jonah's seeing that fungus that uh, blackened the facade and just really fighting that and, and really you know, insisting that, you know, that we can't have that. And so for decades, they were addressing the problem by relentlessly cleaning it, right? Um, because it, that was part of what had to happen, and we accept that and understand it. Um, and so we have Henry sitting there with Gary, and Henry saying, you know, well, Khan wanted it to silver, and the weathering thing is an important aspect, and it becomes the palette. And, you know, these are two guys who work in the trenches and speak technical languages, and they were, you know, man to man, marine to marine, I guess I think they both served in the military. And it was just like, you could understand that, that it was okay for one to, to come to understand that if we can find a better way, maybe we don't have to relentlessly clean it all the time and we can dial back that and allow some of the weathering to happen. 
And I just want to add to that. I don't know that I stressed, uh, stressed that strongly enough in my uh, presentation, but you know what Khan or what Jonas wanted for the site was actually not achievable in the environmental conditions at the Salk Institute. So you know, there's a solu the solution that's going forward is somewhere in the middle of that. And I mean, that's a, I mean, but that's been kind of a constant conversation throughout the project. Uh, and the thing is, it's not just true of wood, it's true of all the other materials he used in all the other places, that conservation is necessary. And if you go and look, for instance, at the Indian Institute of Management, which is relatively well off for, for a poor country like India, this is, uh, as Bill said, the Harvard Business School of India. If you look at how that has been allowed to deteriorate compared to the National Assembly Building of Bangladesh, the poorest country in the world, they have done their all to keep that building in good shape. Of course, it has worn to a certain extent and things have had to be replaced, but y you look at it and you think every possible resource in this country has been used to keep that building the way it was uh, in an admirable, a really admirable way. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have uh, about two little questions. One is about um, that it is used mostly concrete, as you said, the South Institute, but uh, Southern California being an earth, uh, earthquake-prone area, is this a good material to use for, uh, for earthquake? I understand like in Japan, mostly of wooden, right? Wooden structure because uh, it has so many earthquakes. And how big an earthquake can this uh, sustain? That's one question. Another one is South Institute being a scientific institution to study neurology and bio uh, kind of life science. Yet concrete to me is a very dead material. It's very rigid and not life at, at all. So it seems to me this somewhat incompatibility of the material used for this kind of research institute. Uh, I'll, I'll answer those questions from a purely amateurish and aesthetic point of view and then Bill can do it technically. But on the first question, uh, August Commandant was aware of earthquakes, and in fact, when he was extending the Virendil trusses and making them more flexible and yet stronger for the Salk Institute, as opposed to the way they had been at Richards, he said to Fred Langford, and Fred imitated uh, August Commandant's German-Estonian accent, he said, it will roll back and forth like a drunken sailor. <laughs> this, is, this is what he thought he was making, so maybe other modifications have been necessary. In terms of the concrete, I just want to know, have you actually been out to the Salk and seen the concrete? Yes, I've been there in the evening, Because to me, when I first saw it, and I still feel this way, it made concrete into a living presence. It, there was something about the way that concrete was designed, including the size of the panels. They're just a little bit larger than human size. The combination of them with the teak and with the glass it, there was something about the concrete that was warm and human. If you had said to me the word concrete before I went there, I would not have imagined it looked the way it did. But the fact that you can see the texture of it, but that it's smooth, that, that all of the edges are very carefully calibrated, it's not cracked or it doesn't have bleeds the way concrete normally does. It's, it's a very precise artistic material in the way it's used at the Salk for the first time, that is, Nobody had done anything with concrete like that before the saw. And I'll just add about um, earthquakes. Uh, in the great earthquake in Tokyo in 1923, there was the earthquake and the subsequent fire. So building using monolithic concrete that's reinforced was very good uh, solution. And many Japanese architects pursued that in the years uh, following uh, that, that earthquake. The fire, of course, also consumed much of the city, um, and concrete, for its fireproof uh, qualities, uh, had a virtue. Um, the second part of your question is about exposed concrete and the fair face concrete expression. Um, I would add to what Wendy said, um, materials with no sense of ostentation. That idea that concrete is among the most humble of materials um, and that you have a place that's dedicated to scientific research where you've chosen a material that as the primary means of architectural expression, structure, and all of that, uh, has that sense of the humble. Khan very much was appealed 
uh, that idea appealed to Khan very much. And so if you could use the most basic and humble of materials and have that quality uh, of connection through how you detail it, the, the chemistry of the concrete so it has this surface that through the course of the day and the change of the seasons, it, it, it's luminous in its presence there, as, as Wendy uh, was suggesting. That's pretty magical. And the concrete that you see down at the fire station in downtown San Diego that I've walked by every day going up to Balboa Park is not the same concrete that Khan is doing. Um, so I think we, we have to spend time with it is one of the points I was making in, in my talk. And I just want to remind you where he got the idea for concrete, the Romans. There's concrete in the Pantheon. So concrete can last forever, even in a country that has earthquakes. 